Cool. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, of course. Um, and for tonight, um, we're going to continue sort of a topic that we started talking about last week. And the topic that we start, started talking about were, or what is called the three doors to liberation. They are emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. And last week, we talked all about the first of those, which is emptiness. So we talked all about shunyata. Oh, by the way, those are the, these are the words again. Oop. So those are the three doors of liberation. And tonight, we're going to be talking about animita, what is translated normally as signlessness. Um, so tonight's going to be, um, it's going to be kind of a heavy night, probably, honestly. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into a lot of um, philosophy, for lack of a better term. Uh, this is going to be a deep dive into some Buddhist philosophy, uh, but I am going to do my best to try to make this uh, practical. I don't want it to be too, you know, um, highfalutin in that sense. Um, but this idea of animita, signlessness, is a tricky one. So um, let's dive in. So this idea of animita, signlessness. So it begins with actually the idea of a nimitta, a sign, <laughs> because this is no sign, a nimitta. And when we get to talking about a nimitta, <laughs> it already gets complicated. <laughs> and it gets complicated because there's actually like some really interesting ideas that we need to talk about first before we can talk about nimitta and a bunch of related ideas. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is what in Western philosophy would be called qualities. We know them, or we talk about them in the Dharma doors, and I talk about these a lot, and I use the word characteristics. And indeed, the quality of something, which is to say the characteristics of something, that's what we're talking about tonight. And so we're going to talk about lakshana tonight as well. And I'll, I'll show that word in a minute, but I want to stay fixed on nimitta. So in, and now I got to... I don't need to, but I actually would like to give you a quick background education in some Western philosophical ideas. And it's just to kind of acquaint us with a way of thinking, and then we'll go back to the, the Buddhist version. But whether we're talking about Buddhism or Western philosophy, there was an idea and not an idea. Oh, oh, and by the way, too, um, what I'm about to talk about, you could classify it as that we're talking about ontology. Ontology is the study of being, the study of existence, like things existing versus not existing. <laughs> so this that exists, like the study of existence is called ontology, study of being. We are also going to be talking about what would be called epistemology, which is the study of how we come to know things. How do we know anything? Like, how do we know things are true? How do we know they're not true? How do we know they exist or they don't exist? So the study of knowledge or knowing, like, how do we know? That's called epistemology study of being. And in general, we're talking about classic metaphysics. 
And metaphysics is its own term that is problematic because metaphysics, people think it's about like astral realms or something like that when it's not. Metaphysics is the deeper underlying physics of reality. So in Western philosophy, in thinking about the objects of the world, it was, um, we basically, or they, we, they attribute what I'm about to say to a philosopher named John Locke in his famous essay concerning human understanding, or that might've been Hume, Hume and Locke are very, their contemporaries or they're at the same time and they're talking about the same ideas. And what Locke introduces is the difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities. And once I get into these, these are gonna sound very familiar to you, or at least the ideas that we're talking about. So in Western philosophy, beginning with Locke, they make a distinction between the qualities of something that are objectively qualities of an object. These are traditionally things like size, what they would actually call extension, like extending into the world. So length, width, and height, but all of three of those are called extension. So like extension, weight, weight used to sort of be a primary quality, um, different basic fundamental aspects of an object. And the criteria for a primary quality was that it was measurable. Like you could get a ruler out, you could get a scale. So the, the, the things that were objectively measurable and demonstrable to others, those were considered primary qualities. Secondary qualities, Locke tells us, are sort of something like color. Color is the classic secondary quality. And color is considered a secondary quality because the color of something will actually be different depending upon the eyes that you have. And so when we talk about the secondary qualities of things, we're talking about the subjective qualities of them. These things that are, that they arise in the mind of the individual via the specific sense organs of that individual. And so for a long time, Western philosophy made the distinction between those two kinds of qualities, the ones that were inherent and objective versus the ones that were subjective and therefore not inherent. That actually goes along for a while until the late 1700s when this guy Immanuel Kant comes along and actually says both of those qualities, primary and secondary, are actually subjective. And then this moves the history of Western thinking, moves it into what is called the period of idealism where even those primary qualities were now understood to be somewhat subjective. However, Kant, of course, Immanuel Kant, he's no Buddhist in that way. And one of the things that lingers in Kantian idealism is that there's still something out in the world, <laughs> but we have no sensory access to what is actually out there. And all qualities, all qualities of things are going to be subjective, but there's a way in which we can rationally infer certain things about the external world. And that leads to Kantian philosophy, and that's not what I'm here to talk about. But I am here to talk about that difference between 
primary and secondary qualities. So in the world of Buddhism, they too made a distinction between basically primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities, and by the way, I need to tell you this, if, if you're really uh, uh, interested in philosophy, there is not a direct correlation between these. I'm speaking very broadly and generally, and I'm also not a, really a trained philosopher in that way, so I'm really kind of speaking out of my wheelhouse, but I just want you to know that these things are not a direct correlate, but for the most part, the primary qualities of something were called nimitta, and the secondary qualities of things that were subjective and that kind of arose in the mind of the individual, those are called lakshana. And let me show you that, that that word is called lakshana, in case you've never seen that word before. And that's the word that I'm often using when I talk about qualities or characteristics of things. So let me give you a very, very quick, clear demonstration. I'll, I'll use my background here, but I'm going to give you, give you a very quick demonstration of Nimitta versus Lakshana. So basically the idea here is, is it's like, oh, look, a flower. So that that it looks like a flower is a lakshana. That it appears red is a lakshana. In fact, it's not even a flower. <laughs> if we were to realize that, be like, oh, that's not a flower. Oh, it's paint. It's, it's not even made of chlorophyll and, and like, you know, organic material. It's, it's made of paint. It's a painting. Once we're down to it's not what it looks like, not what it appears like, but as soon as we were to get out some real instruments of measurement, a microscope and these things, we would be like, oh, the flower the flower stuff was just lakshana. If we get down to the fact that it's made out of pigment, and that pigment might be from a stone or something, that would be the namita, the kind of underlying um, materiality that looks like a flower. And so the looking like something appearing a certain way, oh, look, a bird. <laughs> it has the characteristics of a bird. It has the lakshana of a bird. But if we were to be talking about the actual screen, the actual paint, and it, it, it's not that what it looks like, it's like it's materiality. We're getting closer to the nimitta at that point. And basically, and this is going to be complicated. Well, actually, yeah, let me complicate it. I'll just do that. That'll be funner. So there's a, a few levels to this. So in general, Nimitta Lakshana, you can think of as primary objective versus subjective and secondary. You can do that for now. But here's the thing that I want to tell you that's even more interesting. So, yep. So we got to do a quick reminder, a quick deep dive into the nature of the sentient subject, <laughs> the nature of us looking at the world. So from a Buddhist point of view, there are here what are called the five aggregates, the five skandhas. We talk about these all the time. At the most basic level, there is a body of materiality 
physical materiality. And this body of form is made out of six, or it, I should say it's not made out of, but it, it is constituted by six sensory organs. These sensory organs, and this is going to be really important in a minute, these organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the entire body, and the body is not just the skin, it's everything else. <laughs> so between eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain, brain as a sixth sensory organ, those six are the whole kit and caboodle, okay? So those are the six sensory organs. And it's gonna be very important to know that these are called and considered ayatana. I, apologies for all the foreign words, but A-Y-A-T-A-N-A. Ayatana. And ayatana means a base. And the way that you can think about this, one second, Tanya. Oh, actually, no, Tanya, what's your question? You might have the right answer. No, sorry. So base, are you saying it's both form and the six sensory organs are the base? So, excellent. So this word ayatana, which means a base, a really, really good way to think about a base is like any kind of sensor. You know how like you have a digital camera and in the back of the digital camera, there's an optical sensor, right? And like uh, a microphone is a sensor, right? Like it's just sort of like waiting there for the microphone is like just waiting there for sounds to come land on it. So it's like a base. And from the Buddhist point of view, they call all of these sounds that come and land on our ears and all of these visual objects that come and land on our eyes and the, the smells that come land on the little palates inside of our nose. So those objects, the sense objects, they, the Buddhists call them dust, rajas, and they come and they land on our sensors. And those sensors, the eyes, the ears, the nose, tongue, body, and brain are called ayatana, bases, but that word means like a sensor. And Tanya, to answer your question, these senses, these sensors, these ayatanas are made of rupa, are like, are of materiality. But of course, the eyeballs have a different material makeup than the ears, but they're both ayatana. Okay, so at the level of form, rupa, the base level of materiality, if you, and you have to get real geeky, real scientific here now, you have to consider how the material makeup of the eyes are totally different than the ears. The ears have these like three little bones that like rattle around and those rattlings create echoes in your ear canal and all of this stuff happens. And that's very different than an eyeball. And it's very different than a nose and very different than a tongue and so on. So each of these sensors is formed differently. It has a different form, a different shape a different rupa. So the idea here is, is that the six senses are the ayatana or the bases. And then the sensory objects 
things like the sound, the smell that come and land on the sensors, these sensory objects can be called and are called nimitta. So nimitta is the general blanket term for the qualities of things in the realm of form, so just pure materiality, think molecular atomic level. So nimitta are the things that land on the sensors causing sensations. Vedana. So that's the second skandha, by the way. Second aggregate are these sensations. The sensation of seeing something, the sensation of hearing something, the sensation of smelling something. So those are the vedana, and you only get a vedana once you've had sparsha, contact. So the idea here is, and so let me walk you through this, by the way. Oh, yeah, this will be important. So right over there, I've got something. <laughs> now, you can't see it because it's over there. So you don't have any visual contact. And therefore, you're like, you could be trying to look over there, but you can't make contact. So there are, there's no nimitta, no visual nimitta hitting your eye for you to think anything about it. So no contact, no sensation, no reaction. You just can't see it. Can you hear it? No, you can't hear it either. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. The only thing you've got is this tiny little thread, which is the word it. Oh, and you maybe know it's not a feeling or an emotion because I've said it's over there. So you have these like trace amounts of information that it's an, it's an it, it's over there. So it has to kind of be spatially located, but you have no way of knowing how big, how small, what the dimensions, shape, size, all of that. So my point is, is that the sixth sensory organ, the brain, the brain, if, if you're thinking about what I'm talking about, if you're not, then these namita have not landed on the sense base of your mind. But if these words and ideas about the object over there, if they are, if you're thinking about it, that's your sixth sensory organ being in contact with these trace amounts of information I've given you. And so the only thing that has to go on is that. And so it's, it's lacking a lot of information. Now, if it could get a glimpse, if a little nimitta could come and land on your eye, you would then be able to have a better mind sense of what it is. So everybody following me on that subtle relationship between the sensory organs, which give you something to think about. And if you don't have contact through your sensory organs, you can't think about it in that way. Or you can th think about the words, but. Okay, so everybody follow me on this. Yo, yeah, I see you. <laughs> Um, uh, well, I have two My sir, go, you, uh, please. All right, one question I have is, is, is uh, the brain as a sensory organ can get information from the eye, let's say, right? If the eye sees something, then the brain, in a sense, I don't know technically how it works, even though you've told me, the brain has contact with the information from the eye. So. So is that still the nimitta of the object or is that the nimitta of the eye? And, and when the brain, and then, the, and then to 
not to for the brain to have contact with something directly is what you were describing like you have information about something that isn't coming in through any other sensory organ or you're just thinking on your own like i don't know a dream or or just fantasy or an imagination thing good question <laughs> excellent excellent question um so the first thing to make clear on that uh, gnome is the mind brain sensory organ never has direct contact with the quote external world okay so it's always going to be that our five senses our five external sensory organs are the initial sensors sensors of form sound sense flavors tactility our sensory organs then when the little nimitta has come and landed on the sensory organ they're basically in the sensory organ in each of them and this would be kind of in the back of the optic nerve if you're thinking about the the eye there is the generation on the back of the optic nerve of an impression or an image in a in a buddhist world they call those dharmas which is to say that there are these I, ideas is not the right word because they are generated by the sensory organs and the best word i could come up with is an impression mm -hmm. these impressions you can imagine it as being like <clears throat> this is the way that i imagine it is imagine the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the body as being like mirrors and those mirrors are reflecting reality onto another mirror which is the sixth sensory organ and you can kind of think of the thinking mind as looming over the impressions that are in this mirror of the brain mind and the impressions here are being reflected from the five external organs so we're looking at a reflection of a reflection mm -hmm. is the buddhist sense of of sensory experience in that way uh renata one moment noam did that answer anything yeah it did it did but there I was another know. part to your question though well yeah there, the other part of the question is then what then what is dreaming because that's where is All, that coming from? excellent i'm gonna i'm gonna get to it in a second but i'll tell you now dreams in the buddhist worldview are pure samskara samskara which we haven't gotten to yet because i'm working my way up the the skandhas but if you think if you remember that samskara are conditioned thought formations <clears throat> basically things like memory so when we have a dream that is pure samskara we are not in contact with any visual form sound smells or that so it's just pure mind activity in that sense so I'm sort of confusing the mind's function as a sensory organ with the mind's ability to just make shit up which is some scar okay excellent Noman. that brings me to a really important point i like to make regarding this sixth sensory organ the brain the mind in that way manas it would be called the the let's see how can i say this well i'm gonna let that go apologies for that <laughs> i'm gonna let that one because that would, would have taken us into a, even further afield so apologies i can't give a super I have another answer. question but maybe let brendan and renata go first I don't know. sure we'll see if that all 
Um, well, I was just, I don't know. I mean, I, not to further derail hijack and, you know, sully this, this sweet talk, but, uh, I was just thinking, yeah, the mind is doing something different than the other sense organs in that it is making predictions. Um, <clears throat> but, but I'll leave that as a, just a fantastical thought and not necessarily a question question if you'd like, or you can answer. I'll, I'll kind of answer it because I'll, I'll roll both what I was going to say to Gnome and to you together. Like so what I was going to say to Gnome, and I'll try to say it quickly, this brain as a sensor, it's a very subtle but important difference between Buddhist psychology and mainline Western psychology. In mainline Western psychology and neuroscience and everything, the brain is the generator of ideas. Mm -hmm. It's like a fountain of ideas. In the Buddhist realm, the brain is a sensor. And an idea comes floating along and <laughs> sticks to the brain. And so when we're thinking about something, it's because that's what's currently stuck to our mind. And if you, if you get into that, that the mind isn't making these thoughts, it's feeling or sensing these thoughts. As soon as you kind of put your mind in that mode, all of a sudden, well, let me put it to you this way. If I were looking at something and it bothered me, I didn't like the look of it, it reminded me of something, and I, it just, I didn't want to look at it. You know what I could do? Close my eyes. And all of a sudden, I have severed contact and I no longer see it. I could do the same thing with my ears. I know how to do it with my nose. I know how to do it with my mouth. If I'm touching something and I don't like the way it feels, I know how to sever contact and not feel that thing. If it's too hot, like the stove, I can take my hand off. If we are thinking about something that we would not, or we would prefer to not think about, do you know how to close your mind? Do you know how to just stop thinking about something? It would be a nice, almost, <laughs> it would be a kind of a nice superpower, well, wouldn't it? Side effects. <laughs> What I'm getting at is, is I know. <laughs> if you think the mind is the generator of ideas, it becomes very kind of difficult to turn it off. But if you understand, oh, no, the mind is very passive and these ideas are getting stuck to it. So there are these techniques, these meditative Buddhist techniques for removing those ideas that are stuck to the mind. Again, it's just a whole other way of thinking about thinking. One is much more passive where we are more witness to thinking. In the Western, which Western, every, Western science, Western philosophy loves agency. And so we need to be the agent of thinking. We need to be the doer of the thinking. Again, in, in the Buddhist one, it's a little more passive. So, all right, Renata, sorry to make you wait so long. Uh, well, some of my conscience coming back to me and all of his uh, concern about the a priori uh, rules and, um, and how we, uh, like I said, use this, this synthesis of that in terms of our manner of thinking and how that how that compares to Buddhist thought, you know, to use this as a sort of, almost as I actually I sort of see it as similar to computer programming. 
his way of seeing the uh, the ordering of the brain and and the matter in which we do it. Hmm. I'm not. I didn't quite get the, your question, Renata. I just just in terms of his a priori rules. His who who are you referring to? Aunt. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, my my dog snoring in the background. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not, I would not actually feel equipped or prepared enough to really begin a comparison of Kant and Buddhism in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really was using the Western just to set up the basic ideas of these qualities in that way. Okay. Yeah. All right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to waste everybody's time with me speculating is what I'm getting at. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Tanya. Uh, yeah, so, um, so, so I get what you're saying about how thoughts arise. Um, well, well, no, not arise. They just, um, the brain is sensing thoughts and that's somewhat coming from mm. the, the interaction with the sensory organs. Is that correct? Like mm -hmm. some thoughts are, sort of spontaneously associated with stuff that's coming in through the sensory organs. And then you said something about dreaming, that dreaming is all samskara, so conditioning, but so in that case, the brain would be, it's not a sensory organ it's interacting with that's generating the thoughts, it's, somehow the samskara which is sort of like isn't that like the brain sort of it's, I, it sort of feels to me like the brain kind of folding in on itself or something because samskara and memory you know do, yep. do you, you kind of see I, where I'm... I do let's hold off on this because the samskara stuff is okay You're a good. few steps ahead of where I wanted to be right now so okay we're... sounds good I'm cool with that all right because I was really trying to just create I, I'm still actually just trying to define nimitta. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to do. But here's why I've been taking this long route, though. So these ayatana, the bases, and then the various nimitta, and what we're thinking about now or what we want to be thinking about, and this is in line with your question a little bit, Tanya, by the way, but it's about how when I show you something, like if I showed you my hand, there's a way in which the visual base has received the data and that impression has been set. And then this mind sees that impression and that's what has stuck to it. And then there is this, now you are thinking about the visual impression of my hand in that way. Now, why I'm kind of going through the, this laborious process of saying all of this is because in the Buddhist tradition, a practice a practice of sati or shmurti, mindfulness, that particular form of meditation. You know, the one where you focus on like your breathing, right? Well, the breath in that case is an object of the focus. And within the world of Buddhist meditation, there is a way that you can and are advised to meditate on nimitta and what that is 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 like so some classic nimitta are the four great elements you know them as earth water fire and air but as i often like to say earth is not dirt the earth element is solidity. The, 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 qua the quality of being solid 
and things are of varying solidities. I cannot put my hand through a wall. It's very solid. But if it's a piece of paper, I could probably put my hand through it because it's less dense. <laughs> so earth element is about solidity. And I also often like to say that if you look at a periodic table of elements, it's the earth element divided into a hundred and I don't know, what are they up to? 115, 116 elements, but it's the degree of density. <laughs> Hydrogen is the least dense <laughs> of matter. Whereas if you get all the way down to those crazy heavy metals, they're super, super heavy, super dense. So big on earth element, not so big on the earth element in the, in the noble gases and all of that. Fire, or sorry, I should say water is not just H2O water. It's the quality of viscosity, the quality of fluidity, the quality of that. Now in Western science, earth and water are the same thing. Meaning that it's just a matter of um, uh, state, I guess, the state it's in. It could be in the state of a gas, in the state of a liquid, in the state of a solid. But nonetheless, the, the Buddhist who used this tradition of the four great elements talk about solidity, liquidity. The fire element of, is not fire, it's temperature. Everything has a temperature. Some things are very cold, so they are very low on the fire element. Some things are very hot, like lava, and it's very high on the fire element. And the fourth element is air, which isn't uh, oxygen and nitrogen. It, air is actually about the wind, movement. Some things are self-moving, and some things are like a rock and they don't move. Very low on the air element. If you touch a rock, it's very cold, very low on the fire element. It doesn't move, it doesn't produce liquid. So it's very low on the water element, very high on the earth element. So the point is, is that you can really begin to see all of reality as varying degrees of solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement. And basically everything can be seen that way. Now, if you were to take anything, I'll use a classic cup. I know it looks like a cup, but that's gonna be a characteristic, a lakshana, we haven't even gotten to those yet. But there's a way in which you could focus your attention exclusively on the solidity of this object. Like really, really be meditating on, like not the noise, but I'm, but I'm doing this to point out to you like the solidity of it. Now, if you did that, meaning that you used this cup as an anchor for your meditation, but you weren't looking at its color, size, or shape, but you were really just trying to focus on the singular quality of its solidity. Or you could do this with a fire and just really be staring at like a campfire, but in terms of the fire element, that is a nimitta, and that's a classic Nimitta. And what I mean by that is, is that in Buddhism, they use the word Nimitta specifically with this idea as an object of meditative awareness. That is a Nimitta. When you've really isolated this one quality of something. And the reason why I related the Nimitta with the primary qualities of Locke and the old school uh, metaphysi metaphysicians. The reason why I likened it to the primary qualities 
is because the earth element is considered a quality of this. The cupness, the cup, the cupness, that's considered a subjective lakshana. And we haven't even gotten to those yet. So a namita is this objective quality of something. It's what would make it what it is. For example, you can't really see it, but I have my other cup and I have liquid. I've got a uh, tea in the cup. How is it that your mind distinguishes the cup from the tea? Water element, earth element. <laughs> and, your, and your mind doesn't conflate them. It keeps them very separate. So I just want to point out that nimitta are very much the way in which we differentiate the world, this from that, in that way. Okay, so yeah, this is going to be a wild night because um, I haven't, I didn't even really plan to talk about any of that. So this will be very interesting. Let me now tell you, so I don't forget, so that we don't lose it. I now want to tell you about animita, the, the theme for tonight, signlessness. So why do they call these things signs? They're qualities, but why would they call them signs? In fact, if you really dig around, you can even find nimitta and lakshana called omens. Like, like bad signs. Like, so what's up with this language of a sign? Well, the thing about it is, is that a namita, like let's say the earth element of an object, if you made that the focus of your attention, the namita landing on the sensory organ and then you're meditating on that namita, it becomes the cause of one's meditative state. Meaning like if you were to get into a dhyana, you would get into the dhyana via meditating on the namita of the earth element of something. And then that meditation, like, that meditation, that dhyana would have a, a quality to it, a characteristic to it in a way. And it would be a sign that you were in that meditation. That it's a weird, it, it's very hard to express in English because there's a language thing going on with these words, but there's a way in which these namita become signs in Buddhism, and they're signs of a meditative state. I know this isn't being very clear, but I'm just trying to make it as clear as it is to me in that way. There is a clear uh, relationship between these things. The re yeah, Tanya. <laughs> so it sounds like, it, and, and it sounds like if you meditate on a different um, earth or different element that you get a different quality of meditation. Yeah, kind of. Th this will make a lot of sense in two seconds, I promise. So the second of these, the three doors of liberation, this idea of animita. So this is one of those concepts that is very, very important in the world of Mahayana Buddhism. That's the kind of Buddhism we're talking about here on the Dharma doors, the sutra that we're reading. I don't know if we'll get back to it tonight, but it's a Mahayana Sutra. But these ideas, things like signlessness, they're very much a part of the early Buddhist tradition. And so I went, I went digging around through all of my dictionaries, all of my resources, and everything I was reading about Nimitta 
I was finding very disappointing, like the definitions of these things. So I went to the source, the source being the words of the Buddha. If you're not familiar with this book, this is the Majima Nikaya, right? So the, the middle length discourses of the Buddha, the, the medium size discourses, right? And if you didn't know, if you don't know about this collection of suttas, these are very old Pali, the language, Pali language suttas. And the Majima Nikaya is broken into different sections. And each section has a different topic where all the sutras are about that topic. So there's actually a section here on shunyata, what, what in Pali is called shunya, not shunyata, but just shunya, emptiness. Emptiness is the first of the doors of liberation that we're talking about. And so in the section on emptiness, you get uh, maybe three, four or five sutras, suttas about emptiness, but it's not quite the Mahayana version of emptiness. And if you asked me, suttas that are in this section are the precursors to Mahayana Buddhist ideas. Like this is where they were getting their ideas from. And it is in this uh, emptiness sutta, the Sunyas Sutta, the Sutra on Emptiness, where the Buddha talks about something called the Animita, so the signless, but it's technically called the Animita Cetto, C E T O, Animita Cetto Samadhi. S A M A D H I Samadhi. So the Animita Chetta Samadhi is a very, very deep meditative state that the Buddha describes to Ananda. And it is a state where, well, it is a state in which the Chetto, the Chitta, the mind, is in a state of Samadhi on or caused by <laughs> signlessness. And I wouldn't actually say that it's a meditation or a samadhi on signlessness. It's a signless samadhi. And what I mean by that is, is this, if you read this sutta and it comes to the part about the animitta, chato samadhi, the way that it's described is that basically it is a state in which there is no visual formations. So yeah, you could imagine that the eyes are closed or you're in a pitch black cave, but there is no visual stimuli. There's no auditory stimuli, no olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and then because there are no external stimuli coming in, the brain, the sixth sensory organ is deprived of stimulation. And being deprived of stimulation, all it has to go on is samskara. Again, I know we haven't gotten there, but basically just think of it as memory. So all the mind has to go on is memory. It's not getting any new stimuli. And then through prolonged periods of quiet meditation, eventually the chatter of the mind quiets. And what I mean is that all of those ideas that are stuck to the mind get removed and there is no stimulation on the mind either. And the Buddha calls that the animita chetto samadhi, signlessness. It is the samadhi of signlessness. So there is just no sensory input and no sensory thought in that way. 
Now, there's two reasons. And this is, if you do a bunch of research like I tried to do for this talk, you find that it's called signless for two reasons. One, because there are no nam namita. There's no object. I'm not focusing on the earth element. I'm not focusing on that element. I'm not focusing on my anger. I'm not focusing on this or that. In fact, I'm not focusing on anything. And so there are no nimitta. It's animitta. But because of that, the meditation itself has no identifiable characteristics or qualities to it. The meditation itself is animita, signless, meaning there's no signs that you're in it. <laughs> there's no indication that you are in it. And so it's signless for both of those reasons. Okay, Tanya. Uh, there's, a question, there's a question oh. in the chat um, from Ahmed. Yep. Do you see it? Let me, let me grab up. Oh. Would you mind reading Wait, it out? Oh yeah, sorry. Or uh, so the question is: Are nimitta and animitta samadhis correlated to the four form and formless samadhis? So that's a really, really heavy duty question. I'll tell you, actually, Ahmed. I'll tell you. So, in this sutta, by the way, this is sutta number one twenty one in this book. I'll tell you, he begins, the Buddha begins actually with the earth element, with the perception of earth. That, and so like focusing, like I suggested on just the solidity of something. And then from that, the Buddha goes to the ayatana. And it's important to remember that this is a base the base, the, the ayatana of akasha, what is usually translated as infinite space. And Ahmed, that is the first formless samadhi. So the first formless samadhi is infinite space. And that is listed in here as the next place you go after solidity is space then consciousness, which is the second formless samadhi, then nothingness, which is the third formless samadhi, then neither perception nor non-perception, which is the fourth formless samadhi, then the animita cetto samadhi. So oh. Ahmed, this is actually even beyond that because and this kind of is going to go to maybe Tanya's question. I'm getting the questions confused now. But the idea is, is that the samadhi of infinite space has a kind of a focus, meaning it's infinite space. And therefore, it has a certain sign to it, a certain quality to it, if you will. I'd call it a vibe. It's got a vibe to it, right? The, the, the infinite space samadhi has a distinct vibe that is not the same as the vibe you get from the infinite space, or sorry, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, or even the state of neither perception nor non-perception. The animita cetto samadhi is phew, animita. So... It is, in a way, even beyond the four formless samadhis, in, at least according to this text. And it's equivalent to shunyata, to emptiness, at least in this early Buddhist sutta. All right. Noe, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. The uh, so 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 this the this this teaching. If you could just help me out, 
the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha, tr went to all these yogas, to all these forms of meditation. Is this from that, or is this unique to Buddhism? Did it exist in a, in a, a yogi way uh, before the Buddha, which he mastered? And is this before the Buddha, and he's now translating it in his own way? Of course he is. But uh, was it something before the Buddha? Were people doing these meditations? So, thank you. Excellent, excellent question. So, the Buddha, the Buddha famously, his, like at, at least according to the story, the Buddha famously had two main yoga meditation teachers before he went off all by himself and became a Buddha. Alara Kalama and Ramaputra. He first went and studied with Alara Kalama and Alara Kalama had a system and the system of, of dhyana, the system of meditation of Alara Kalama went all the way into the realms of samadhi and went through the formless samadhi of infinite space, the formless samadhi of infinite consciousness, and ended in the samadhi of infinite nothingness. The Buddha studied with Alara Kalama, got into the stage of nothingness, found nothing there, and decided that was not total liberation. And so he went and found another teacher, Ramaputra. As the name Ramaputra suggests, this was the putra, the child of Rama. Rama was a great yoga meditation teacher who claimed to have been able to get into a deeper state of samadhi called the state of neither perception nor non-perception. His son, Ramaputra, supposedly couldn't get into the state of neither perception nor non-perception, but he taught his father's system for doing so. And the Buddha became his student and successfully got into the state of neither perception nor non-perception, surpassing Ramaputra. And Ramaputra was basically like, since you can actually do this, do you mind just teaching the system? And basically the Buddha said no, because he didn't think <laughs> that that was complete liberation either. And so Noe, this, emptiness stuff, animita stuff, this is all pure Buddha innovations. Great question. <clears throat> okay, so are we ready to go further? Excellent. So, I, okay, I've I feel like I've covered a bit about this animita business. I've done a, a decent amount on it. Because now I want to tell you a little bit more, and then hopefully maybe we'll read a little bit from the sutra. But this is actually just such an interesting topic. I want to kind of exhaust it, all of its various angles. So <clears throat> the next thing I want to tell you about. So I was just describing how there are in the realm of form, the body of form, the skanda of form, you get eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. And ears are shaped like ears, function like ears, and therefore they're not eyes. Likewise, in the realm of form, there are sounds that are not the same as smells or scents. <laughs> so in terms of their form, in terms of their shape, their molecular makeup, their different form. So sensory objects of form, sensory organs of form, and when they come into contact, things start to happen. <laughs> so this is the body of form of the sensory organs. And we're boom, 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 getting 
in contact with all kinds of things that we're hearing, seeing, etc. From the contact between those two, as I mentioned, there arises sensations, vedana. But from a Buddhist point of view, it's very important to remember that the word vedana doesn't just refer to the kind of like um, bioelectrical stimulation. Vedana is also about the way, the way that this reacts to sensations, meaning do you want more of it or do you want less of it? Or did you not even notice it? And it's what the Buddhists would just call a neutral sensation. So the idea is, is that if I put my hand on a stove and it's hot, the Vedana isn't just the sensation of the heat. The Vedana is the recoiling, the, I don't want any more of that. Whereas when I eat, a yummy little candy, I want another one <laughs> and another one and another one. <laughs> but the idea is, is you, I want more of them. So the Vedana is a positive Vedana versus a neutral Vedana versus some noise that, I, that didn't even really register. And therefore it's just a neutral, I didn't, I don't want more of it. I don't want less of it. I hardly noticed it. So form meets form, sensations or reactions. Then the next skandha that we want to talk about tonight is samnya. Samnya is translated as perception. Here, there, that's samnya. Samnya is translated as perception. Now, perception is tricky, and I'll use this, I'll use, this is my classic example of the trickiness of perception. So the idea here is, is that there is the namita, just the, the uh, dark light, the curve, you know, the, just the, the actual shape without any significance or meaning, just the qualities of it as an object. But if you're seeing a little bunny rabbit or you're seeing a duck, that's a perception. That's called samnya. Now, of course, you couldn't have samnya without contact and sensation in that way. But what I want to draw your attention to is the difference between this as a shape versus as an object, or as a creature even. Like, again, so now we're beginning to notice that perception is very subjective because half of you Half of you could be seeing a rabbit and half of you could be seeing a duck. Now, here's the thing about it. I wanna show you something, and this is gonna be probably too much, but for some of you, it'll be just enough, so. So, these are in my bad, uh, writing. Yeah. These are the two Chinese characters for Samnya and Lakshana. Uh, and I want you to <laughs> notice, oh, somebody, yeah. oh, sorry. So I want you to notice that this Chinese character is the same as this Chinese character. It's just that this, which is the word for perception, it has the addition of this bottom. And the bottom there is actually the Chinese character for the heart, mind. 
Whereas this is the character for a lakshana, a characteristic or a quality. And so the reason why I'm showing you this is because it's, it's actually why as a student of Buddhism, I started learning Chinese. I liked Chinese, but I actually wanted to really understand Buddhism. And when you learn about the way the Chinese translated these ideas, you can learn a lot from the way that they translated them. So what I'm getting at is, is that perception is related, what, what perception perceives are lakshana. And that relationship between perception and characteristics, between samya and lakshana, it's so clearly demonstrated in these two Chinese characters, meaning the, the actual relationship between the two. So what I'm getting at here is that lakshana characteristics are an aspect of perception or samya, whereas nimitta are at a deeper, almost kind of biological level in that sense. And the point is, if I can find my friend, so you might think this is a rabbit, but you might think it's a duck. And the point is, is that, what's that? You kind of either think it's the ears of the rabbit or the bill of the duck. And so, well, what's a defining characteristic of a duck? Quack, quack, quack. The bill. Ducks have bills. It's a characteristic of them. So what I'm trying to get at is, is that you think it's a duck because you think it has a bill, but you think that's a bill because you already think it's a duck. So that's a kind of dependent origination of characteristics. Also, is it furry or is it feathery? If it's furry, that's a characteristic of a little bunny rabbit. But if it's feathery, that's the characteristic of a bird. So once again, you might perceive these as like feathers because you think it's a duck, but you might perceive it as fur because you think it's a rabbit. So perception, it is. That's well, what we wanna be noticing, Noe, about this trick is that it's happening in the mind. The mind is interpreting nimitta, the mind is interpreting the raw data and then layering meaning and significance on top of it and calling it a bird or a duck or a rabbit or this and that. So really quickly, not to just leave this hanging. So let's say you thought I just held up a picture of a rabbit. And, and let's say you were, one, you were someone who kept going like, why does he keep talking about a duck? <laughs> like, I don't see this duck, right? So let's say you were somebody like that, who just saw the rabbit, couldn't even imagine how that looks like a duck. If I showed it to you again, and you perceived a rabbit again, you have just reinforced your understanding that it's a rabbit. And so now when I show it to you the third time, it's like you are locked into the perception that it's a rabbit. And that condition or that state of being locked into something is samskara, conditioning. Our minds are conditioned. And so the idea is, is that when you first see something, you're kind of like, huh, what is that? What is that? And then you make a decision. 
But when you see it again, you already have that tendency or that habit, perceptual habit. So that's samskara. So from a Buddhist point of view, at least an old school, original Buddhist point of view, what makes you, you, and not me, well, you're that body of form. You have those eyes. I have these. You have those ears. I have these ears. So the first thing that makes you, you, and me, me, is that you're that body of form, and I'm this body of form. But it doesn't stop there because you might like really, really spicy food. Like you get a, a hot, hot pepper and you're loving it. Whereas I eat a hot pepper and my vedana, my reaction is that I don't like it. So now what makes you, you, is your way of reacting to stimuli. And it's not the way I react to stimuli. So you are that body of form and you are those reactions. Whereas this is this body of form and these reactions. But it's not over yet. You might be a rabbit perceiving kind of person. Whereas I might be a duck perceiving kind of person. So that means that you're that way of perceiving. You're actually, you're actually that side of this uh, computer, <laughs> meaning you're perceiving it from that side and I'm perceiving it from this side. So what makes me me is this vantage point, this perspective. And what makes you you is your that perspective, having that perception. You're conditioned entirely differently than I'm conditioned. Based upon the way you perceive the world, which is different than the way I perceive the world, based upon the way you react, which is different than the way I react, which is different than your body of form, different than my body of form. <clears throat> so, all four of those skandhas, form, sensations, perception, and conditioning, are what make each of us not the other person <laughs> and who, quote unquote, we are. Oh, by the way, there's the fifth skandha, vijnana, consciousness. Consciousness is the present state of awareness that is the result of your conditioning, your perception, your reactions, your body of form. But right now, the only vijnana, the only consciousness there is, is the one happening right now. This is vijnana, but we want to pay attention to where and how this state of consciousness is arising from. The particular conditioning, the particular perceptions, the particular reactions, and the particular body of form. Noe? Thank you. Um, that's what's pointing to. That's what the Buddha is teaching me. That's what the Buddha is pointing to. When the boy was <laughs> this, this, not there, here. Don't sit there, sit here. And as I practice my practice, I'm constantly coming to here. And that's what I hear. That's what I <laughs> heard. <laughs> that's what I'm perceiving. And that's what I'm practicing. Is the Ex here. Thank Excellent. Excellent, Noe. And on that note of being here now, on that note, if we really, really want to be here now, then it's an ever-changing, ever-flowing state of the five skandhas. And this right now is the, 
the, the current state of the situation and where we get confused is the idea of a self who was the same self a week ago, two weeks ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even though 20 years ago, very different body of form, very different reactions, very different perception, totally conditioned differently. And of course, then 20 years ago, it was that present state of consciousness. And so the point I'm getting at, Noe, is that if you get really into the present moment like you're talking about, there isn't even anyone there to be in the present moment. Yeah. Okay, so everybody doing okay with this, for some reason, uh, five skandhas dharma talk I've just given? Yeah, everybody good in the space? Okay. Yeah. I, I have this like need to try to help you along here, but I'm also, I am also a little bit confused. Yep. So let me keep it there. Exactly. Um, well, <clears throat> the, the signlessness thing, I mean, I, I, it sounds like to me, I mean, I think that's a shitty word for it. And, I and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, so, Maybe it's like something close to the quality of the experience or something. I don't know. I mean, is that is that at least like in the neighborhood? Um, it's in the neighborhood. But more importantly, Brendan, you are reeling me back in. <laughs> hey, you know, no problem. You're reeling me back in. Because I, 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 there's something very important I need to say. Yep, you do it. It's, it's about the animita, this idea, because that's our theme for tonight. So the, the thing that I want to say before I run out of time and I don't get to say it, if you read about the signless in here, as I said, it basically sounds like a state of sensory deprivation. And it is, it is described as a state of sensory deprivation. And Buddhism, early Buddhism, all forms of Buddhism, extol the virtues of sensory deprivation. It is a very healthy thing to take a break from sensory stimuli. We are overstimulated. The Buddha, 2,500 years ago was saying we're overstimulated. So think about that in the era of internet and all of that, right? We're, we're hyper overstimulated. So going into very deep states of meditation where the mind was given a break from processing data and information, that was considered healing, like sleep. Just be chill for a while and let things calm down, okay? So the Animita Cheto Samadhi that's listed in here is basically, you can imagine, is being in a cave, sensory deprivation tank, and being totally tuned out. The Mahayana tradition that we've been talking about that, that deals with these three quote-unquote doors of liberation they have a very different sense of these three things. And the different sense is that one, and I should say the bodhisattva, a bodhisattva experiences emptiness, signlessness, and the third, wishlessness, with their eyes wide open, walking down the street, interacting with the world not in a cave, not in a sensory deprivation tank. And the point is, is it all begins actually with last week's talk about emptiness. The point is, is that this object that you might meditate on, and we have already tonight, we've separated out the cup. The cup is 
that's like a duck or a rabbit. That's like an idea, a concept. So the cup is gone. But then we're still left with the, the, the thing. And that's what we dealt with last week. The idea of something. Forget what it is. The idea of one thing. Now, the question is, is, does that one thing include this or not? And all of a sudden, it's like, but wait a minute. It kind of looks like there's two things. What is the one thing that we're talking about? And so I'm not going to go through all of last week's lesson on emptiness, but the point of emptiness is it's about the presumption of a subject, of there being one thing there. And, you know, the, the better example of an illusory single object is this, because this is by no means one object. There's so many different things here, but how easily the mind holds it as just one thing. So emptiness is about that one thing. Signlessness or animita is about the characteristics or qualities of that one thing. And if we understand that there isn't one thing there, that that's just an illusion or that's just a, a reified concept, then we understand, oh, that then there's nothing to have, nimitta. And that is a state of mind. It is a state of wisdom to know that all reified entities are simply that reified entities, and they don't have any svabhava, they don't have any inherent existence. And so when you're in that state of mind, you can have your eyes open, you can be walking around, knowing all phenomena is empty, and therefore these characteristics are not out there. They are all arising, and they are all illusory in that sense. And all of this starts to lead us to next week's Dharma talk on wishlessness, desirelessness. And I hope you can start to see how if they're like, it's like, do you want this? And of course, if you think it's a clock and a beautiful clock and all of those things, then there's room for wanting. But if you understand that there isn't actually one thing there, and that's just a delusion of your mind projecting out reified <laughs> entities. If you understand that, you realize, oh, there's nothing external to want. And that begins to put one in a much more upekshik frame of mind. And it comes from a wisdom of understanding emptiness, not from a stoic ability to withdraw your senses, if that makes sense. Yeah, no. Um, it seems like just like with the duck's hair or the or fur or feathers and the rabbit's fur, that the characteristics coincide with the uh, the um, object with the 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 with the perception rather the perception. and excellent. The, excellent so in that case it isn't it doesn't uh, it's not that emptiness leads to signlessness it's, don't they kind of co-arise like the the lack of an inherent existence of an item is the same as its lack of characteristics. Like one leads the other leads the one. Absolutely. They are 
three three aspects of the same coin in that way. Absolutely. Thank you. And so I wasn't you gonna also say answered my other question that I didn't ask. Oh, cool. So thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to circle back to one thing I said about the dreams and samskara, all the a dream being total samskara. Well, if you understand that there's no clock out here, but the only place that the clock arises in is in the conditioning. Mm -hmm. If you understand that, it's how you can see a clock in a dream. It's the same clock as this one, because this one isn't here either. So all of those conditioned sensory memories in that way, that's what we experience in a dream. And it's why I said the thing about dreams are just pure samskara in that, that way. Wow, I keep thinking that's somebody else. Oh, oh, they can hear us, fuck. Um, <laughs> Thank you for listening to us. Have you heard us? Um, we might have to bleep that out later. Um, <laughs> the first Dharma doors bleep. <laughs> it's like, but, 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 Honey. like, isn't like pretty much whether you're waking or dreaming, it's all samskara. Samskara, Excellent. because the, the, the dust falling down onto your sensory organs is not, it's empty as well and not individual stuff. And, and, I I didn't get to get all the way there, but of course, the idea of eyeballs is a samskara. Yeah. And that's some deeper Mahayana Heart Sutra stuff that we'll get into next week. Yeah. Yeah. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. <laughs> right. No dust. Samskara, all co arising. Yeah. No Ex dust. Excellent. Excellent. But just like in a dream, we can be just as deluded and desirous and angry of illusory dust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. I gotta, I gotta, gotta bring it here. <laughs> so, I'm so so glad. I hope you guys liked tonight. I didn't know how it was gonna go with so many crazy ideas floating around. So, but that was like great. It was oh good. Yeah, that was a lot. That was very. Um... <laughs> we we worked the yes. mind muscle. I always think of it as like yoga, and I know that a lot, there's, but, but I think of my mind bending and stretching, and you know, like. Yep. <laughs> this is it's what they call jnana yoga. Oh. Jnana yoga is a form of yoga, and that's what we do every Sunday night. <laughs> Blow our minds, right? right? <laughs> knowledge, knowledge yoga, and it's funny it's that you should say that, Tanya. That it feels like you are doing stretches. So. <laughs> oh yeah, my brain it feel, definitely feels like that. So. Then we're doing it right. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. As long as I don't pull anything, you know, <laughs> <laughs> something blows out. But anyway, thanks so much, Michael.